Hello, and welcome back to Life Groups. This is our third quarter, our August groups, and I'm just so excited to be with you tonight. And I know that you're enjoying Life Groups and the people that are around you in that particular room, wherever you're meeting, whatever home you're in. And we just want to say again, thank you so much for coming to supporting, being a part and committing to Life Groups. You know, Life Groups, uh, fill a very big void in people's lives. People nowadays are, are missing connection. You can even go to a church and attend faithfully, but not really be connected to anyone in the church. But coming to life groups allows you to be around people on a consistent basis. This time we're doing three Wednesdays in a row where you will connect with them. And it'll be more than just people that are at the same building on Sunday and Wednesday, but there'll be friendships formed. And we hope that people that you connect with in your life group become more than just buddies at the group. I'd, I'd love to see you going to dinner with them on Friday nights or meeting with kids at the park on Saturday or maybe going to the beach Sunday, Sunday evening, but just getting that deeper connection. So thank you so much for coming. And we want to say a big thank you to your host. Would you give them a hand of appreciation? Thank you so much for opening your home and allowing us all to come in. We know that you cleaned and you stressed out and you made this place wonderful and we appreciate your sacrifice so much. We also wanna give a big thank you to Brother Delion who uh, takes these videos that I make and makes them so much better and adds graphics to them and puts the words on the screen for you and different things that he does. So if you see Brother Delion, please give him a hand of appreciation. He's a pretty good guy. I also want to take a moment to get you to uh, and do to encourage you rather to bring guests with you. There's so many people. And we say this often and and possibly some of you are already tuning me out because I say it so often. But there are a lot of people who get overwhelmed with church. They just can't seem to uh, make that commitment to be at church on a Sunday. You've been inviting them over and over. It's not because you haven't invited them. It's because people just have this weird thing about going. Invite them to a life group. Tell them we're going to go to this house because this friend of mine makes the best. You fill in the blank. We're going to go have some great food. Oh, and by the way, when we're there, we're going to do a little Bible study. But we're going to have a lot of food and a lot of fellowship. You'll be amazed at how many people will do that way faster than actually coming to church with you. And once they come to life group, you try to get them back to the next life group, then you won't even have to invite them to church. They'll want to come. They'll want to be with the people they've connected with. Connection is that important. All right, let me make a couple of announcements here. First of all, Sunday at 10 a.m. Everyone say 10 a.m. 10 a.m. is our Christian development class. I really want to push this hard. We need more people to be committed to that. The 10 o'clock class is another opportunity for you to get the word in. We don't do service at 11 and 630 at night. We've combined it down so you can have a Sunday afternoon to rest. So that 10 o'clock should never be viewed as optional service. If this is your church, if you've committed to this church, we want you to be at the 10 o'clock Christian development class. If you have children, they'll go into classes. And if you don't, come in, be on time, 10 o'clock. There's about a 30 minute lesson that will be taught. And then we'll have a quick break. And then we come back in for prayer. And then we start our worship service. I want to see you there at 10 a.m. Also, Next Monday night at 7.30, we are having prayer, specific prayer, for our Dominion Conference that's going to be coming up. This coming up Monday at 7.30 will be the Black and Blue Team. The Black and Blue Team. And these teams were what we used the first of the year for when we did our big push and broke the churches up into four groups. And we had a fun fun contest of getting people to come and prayer meetings. They're, the two groups that are meeting this Monday are black and blue. The following Monday, the 19th, will be teams red and green. Now, we 
would love for you to come to both prayer meetings. But if you have to choose a Monday night, we want you to choose your particular group. The group leader will be sending you out a text, a reminder, but that'll be 7.30 next Monday night. We're going to consolidate the prayer meeting down to about 30, 40 minutes tops. Uh, we'll be leading it some in the microphone. We're going to have a move of God because I know God's going to do great things at our Dominion Conference. And that's going to be on Thursday the 29th and Friday the 30th. We're going to have a powerful service. If you have not asked off of work for Friday morning, go ahead and do that tomorrow. Tell your boss, I got to be there uh, for service. It's going to be from around 10 to to one o'clock probably you'll be done. So if you got to go in early, that's cool. If you got to go in late, that's cool. But everyone, we want to have a full house Friday morning to hear brother and sister McKee as they minister. We're going to have a wonderful time in the Lord. Dominion, 29th and 30th this month. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump into our lesson tonight. And hopefully you've already got a handout and a pen. If you haven't, please let your host know so they can get you one. And so we can get into our Bible study uh, here tonight. And so our lesson one, we're going to be talking about this subject. I'm going to be talking to you tonight about the power of being born again. The power of being born again. And we're going to get into this, into some detail, answer some questions, and give us some full understanding what it means when a person said, I've been born again. In your notes, 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 will be a scripture that we'll launch from and we'll come back to. But it's where we're going to glean our lesson from it tonight. It says this, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become no. When a person is born again, they have become a new creature in Christ. All things pass away. All things become new. So, in your notes, let's talk about this. What does it mean to be born again? Now, if you've come under my ministry very long, you know that I like to answer things with Scripture. I think it's the best way to handle questions. Because if you go by what some people say or some people think, uh, that may not be the truth. They may be sincere. But we want to know what the Bible says. And so Jesus made it very clear. In your notes, he made it clear being born again of the water and spirit was mandatory. That's your fill-in. It was mandatory. It was not optional. I, I didn't say that. Jesus said it. If you plan to get into heaven, you've got to be born again of water and born again of the Spirit. He would later appoint the apostle Peter and give him the keys to the kingdom. And with that key, he would actually open the door of salvation so others could be born again. We see this in Acts 2, where he opens the door to the Jewish people. And then we see it also in Acts 10, where he opens the spiritual door to the non-Jewish, the Gentile people. And let's take a look in your notes. As Peter opened the door and gave us some explanation on being born again. Notice where he says, Acts 2.38, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So when a person is born again of water and born again of spirit, it means to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And when the Bible refers to baptism, it comes from a Greek word, and I won't try to bore you with Greek words tonight, but the Greek word that was translated for us into English, baptized, it's, it's a word that means to immerse. It means to dunk. 
to completely go underwater. So Peter said, repent, tell God you're sorry. And then because you're sorry, go get in water and be baptized in the name of Jesus, completely covering you with that water. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So when a person is born again, in your notes, what happens to that individual? What, what goes on when they're truly born again, when they're baptized and they're filled? What truly happens? In your notes, God takes ownership that you fill in, ownership of them. God takes ownership of them. Take a look at our scripture here, 1 Corinthians 6 and 9, Paul writing. He says, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. For you, ye, are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Notice which are God's. When you were born again, you became God's property. You became God's property. That's why you took on his name. You became his. You were baptized in the name of Jesus. God took ownership of you. Your abode, your dwelling place, your body became God's. He lives there. He took up residence there. He purchased it and it became his. Now, I, I, I think, and, and if you missed Wednesday night at the church there, you missed a good setup for what I'm about to say here. I hear so much false teaching in modern day Christianity concerning this. It blows my mind. Because I've heard people make statements like, yeah, our bodies become the temple of God. God owns it, but a temple has many rooms. And so the spirit of God may, may live in somebody, but there's like a room over here that the devil's in. And, and so uh, this is so false. Jesus made it really clear. You can go read Luke, Luke 11. He made it very clear because they accused him of having a devil. He said, no, we, we, we don't abide in the same house. As a matter of fact, he went on to teach that when one stronger comes into a house, he kicks the other one out. He takes all of his spoils. He divides it among himself. And we serve a God that's all powerful. Now, I know Hollywood's built up the devil so much. And I know Hollywood and, and, and maybe people you're around and have, have tried to tell you that Satan's so strong. And, and no, when God filled your body with the Holy Ghost, he evicted the devil. The devil's gone. He's out. When a person's born again, I want to be very clear. When a person has been born again, there is no devil inside of them. Can they be oppressed? Of course. But they're not possessed. There's a difference between possession and oppression. The enemy cannot possess you. Now, if you're dealing with people who've never been born again, there's, there's a chance they are filled with the devil. There's a chance they are possessed. But once an individual has been born again, God has taken ownership and God is all powerful. He's not going to allow the devil to be inside there. I want to make that clear. Because there's a lot of crazy teaching in modern day Christianity that people can have both. You can't have both. And Wednesday night, we taught, this is why you need a pastor. You need someone that can tell you these things to combat all of the foolishness that I'm hearing taught in modern day. I want to be clear with you again. Jesus said it. 
So it's crystal clear. I don't live in the same house with the devil. My temple, when God fills you with the Holy Ghost, he takes over. So number one, God owns the house. In your notes, two, old things pass away. That's your feeling. Old things pass away. Old things pass away. Notice in your notes, 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. When you were born again, something powerful happens when God takes ownership of you. You become a new creation. You become new. Even though you're 20, 40, 60, however old you are, you are reborn spiritually. It's not a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing. We are reborn, born again spiritually, and we become new. And the things about us are new spiritually as well. Because old things passed away. God came in and cut loose all the old things. All the old things connected to you, tied to you. All the old things that were oppressing you, coming. God came in and evicted the devil, kicked him out. This has become his abode. And all things have become new. All things have passed away. Everybody say that with me. All things have passed away. Now, it's important that we teach this to you to get you to understand this because a lot of people are sincerely not understanding this because they'll say, well, I, I have felt this way, particularly with, with homosexuality. I felt this way my whole life. Old things passed away when you were born again. Well, uh, Pastor, but my family has a lot of witchcraft and and uh, there's a lot of spiritual stuff going on. So I, I think there's curses that are still attached to me. Old things have passed away. Pastor, I, uh, I really got around a lot before I came to God. I slept with a lot of people. Does that mean that, that my soul's tied to, to all these people and I'm connected? Old things have passed away away. When you were born again, all the old connections severed, gone, taken, confiscated. God came in and he became the ruler of your home. Look in your notes, John 8 and 36. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye are free Indeed, that means without question. You are free without question. You are free indeed. Now, we were at church. I'd be like, come on, somebody. That ought to make somebody excited. That ought to put a clap in somebody's hand. and That ought to put a dance in somebody's feet. All that old stuff, gone. It's behind me. When I got baptized in Jesus' name, washed away all my past, all that stuff's gone. When I got filled with the Holy Ghost, spirit came in me, drove everything else out. Now I'm God's property. Now the devil has no power over me. And let me pause here because if you're talking to somebody, and I, and, and I have to repeat this often, if you're talking to people who've not been born again, Satan has a lot of power in their life. Man, the devil can do a lot of stuff. People can put curses on them and, and the enemy can speak crazy thoughts in their ears and they can get around people who Satan's speaking to them and it's a lot of confusion. But when you are born again, something powerful happens. Satan is pushed away. And to the born again Christian, God makes such an impact that your greatest adversary is not even the devil anymore. Before you were born again, oh boy, that was a tough one. But when you were born again, the spiritual wickedness 
that you face, spiritual wickedness, principalities, the devil, demons, all this stuff that you can't see, powers, spiritual wickedness, that is no longer your greatest threat. And I, I'm pausing for effect here because I want this to really get into somebody's mind here. I, I want this word to stick to your brain. The devil is not your biggest adversary anymore when you're born again because you've been given power. You've been given authority. Having the Holy Ghost means God is in you. When you speak, you speak with authority given you by God. You can rebuke devils. You can say, leave me alone. You can say, not in this house. You, you have that authority because that power came when you were born again. Where before you was born again, those words meant nothing. But one greater than he has come into you when you were born again. So our greatest adversary is no longer the devil. So all of you spending so much time talking about the devil's killing me, the devil's doing, the devil's trying to destroy me, the devil's wreaking havoc, the devil's doing, oh, you know, you need to stop for a moment and listen to pastor. The devil is not your greatest adversary. You want to know what it is? Look in your notes. Our greatest adversary is our selves that you fill in. Our selves is flesh. Flesh is our greatest adversary, not the devil. It's not the little red devil with the black goatee and the fork and the pitchfork and the long tail. That's not your greatest devil. Your greatest devil, and I'm going to get close to the camera for effect. Your greatest devil is that devil you look in the mirror at. That's your greatest devil. Your flesh. Our flesh, ourself. It's not the enemy. Oh, it's easy to have him as a scapegoat, isn't it? Isn't it? It's easy to always say, yeah, the devil made me do it. Yeah, the devil's just destroying my marriage. The devil attacking my finances. He's destroying my marriage, attacking my finances. It's so much easier to do that instead of saying, you know what? I can be hard to live with. That's why my marriage is in trouble. I run my mouth. I say too much. I let anger go crazy. I break stuff. I act a fool. That's what's really wrong with my marriage. But it's so easy to say, oh, we, we got to go. We got to find Ghostbusters. We, we got to have a seance. Pastor, you got to come over and kick the devil out of our house. Uh, he's not your greatest adversary. You are. It's easy to say devil's killing your finances, but I guarantee you if I pulled your bank statement out I can, and see where your money's going, I can tell you who your devil is. You're supposed to see all those Amazon charges, all those restaurants, all them new shoes. and Come on now. It's not the devil. It's us. It's flesh. So when you're born again, Satan, he moves down. But now you have, as Paul described it, a great treasure. It's the Holy Ghost, Spirit of God, a great treasure. But it's locked in an earthen vessel, a vessel of flesh. So our flesh is going to be our battle. James 4 and 7, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. In your notes, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. See, that's where it is. Submission. It's bringing you down. It's controlling flesh. It's taking your will and submitting it. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee. It's, 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 it's not even a contest. It's not a, the devil will flee once you're submitted. So it, it really begs the thought process, the question. If you're always fighting the devil, maybe you should start checking. Do I have areas in my life where I'm not submitted to God? 
Because if I'm submitted, he flees. He's got to go. When I resist under submission, he goes. So the enemy's not our biggest adversary. It's us. It's first listed, submission. I've got to submit. And so how do I get my flesh under control? Because that's my greatest adversary. When I was born again, Satan got evicted. Now I got to deal with me because the spirit in me is so willing to do right. But the flesh, the Bible said, is weak. It's weak. So I'm going to give you two ways in closing here to get submitted to God. Two ways to bring your flesh under control. The first one is a dirty word. And oh, when I say it, some of you are going to cringe. Fasting. Fasting is one of the best ways to bring your flesh under control. Fasting. When you deny it food, you will be amazed at how strong your flesh is. All kind of things start coming to the top. All kind of emotions. All You have reactions. Your flesh will start telling you, oh, I want to be in control. But fasting will humble your soul. David said that. He said, I humbled my soul with fasting. Fasting so powerful, it breaks the bands of wickedness. Fasting so powerful when it brings us, when I say us, I mean our flesh, when it brings us under, when we submit through fasting, our faith explodes. Fasting is a great way to become submitted to God. Fasting says to your will, no, you're not in control. I'm going to let God be in control. Number two, you got to make up your mind. What I mean by that is controlling yourself. You got to fast to submit, and then you got to make up your mind. You got to tell yourself, no, I'm going to do this. No, I'm submitting to his word. I'm submitting to God's authority. I'm submitting to his church government. I am bringing myself under authority. I am going to control myself. This will help your marriage. This will help your life. This will help again. And I keep coming back to it. This will help you stop blaming the devil. You don't need to rebuke a, a spirit of lust if you're watching porn on your phone. It doesn't work that way. It's not going to leave. It's going to keep coming back to you until you're submitted. And you say, I'm submitting. And I hope this is making sense to you here. So in closing. Fasting and making up your mind. What I mean by that, it, if, if you're the type of person who's got to have somebody make decisions for you and they got to push you, you're going, to you're going to struggle. You're going to struggle. Jesus gave us the best example. His flesh did not want to go to Calvary, but he prayed in that garden. He prayed and he controlled himself. He made up in his mind. He said, not my will, but thy will be done. When I'm fasting, I'm crucifying my flesh. You need to write this somewhere on your notes. You cannot rebuke the flesh. It must be crucified. You can rebuke devils, but you cannot rebuke the flesh. It must be be crucified. So when I fast, I bring the flesh down. When I make up my mind and I say, I'm going to control myself. When I want to get angry and say, I'm going to control myself. When I have this impulse, this desire, I'm going to control myself. When I make up my mind, those two things help me remain free because God set me free when I was born again. And when you were born again, God came in he took over. He controlled you. He came in and said, okay, now you got an opportunity. Doesn't mean you're going to be perfect because you got flesh. But if you'll keep that flesh under control, if you'll stay submitted to God, when you resist the devil, he's gone. You stay submitted to God. When your flesh starts to crawl up, 
you develop that habit of always pushing it down, you'll have victory in your life. I hope you've enjoyed this lesson. You're going to have discussion to follow. I'm going to see you Sunday at 10 a.m. God bless you.